Well, it's great to speak to an audience like this. Um, always excited to speak to people working on really hard but important problems. If I can get my slides. Somebody helping out here? With the <laughs> um, the presentation will be up soon. Okay. The presentation will take a few minutes. Um, well, it's always exciting to speak to an audience like this. I think what we have is a deep technical problem, mostly. And so let me start with defining the problem. There's about 10% of the world's population that has a great lifestyle today. It's environment rich, energy rich, transportation rich, education rich, entertainment rich, rich in every way. Seven billion people want it. And we can't have 10 times the number of resources. So we need technology as a resource multiplier. Hence, we need radical solutions. We need radical innovations that really multiply what we can do with a ton of steel, a ton of materials, a ton of cement, a ton of car, a ton of education, a single physician, a single everything. But the good news is failure probabilities don't matter because even a small chance of changing the world is the opportunity all of you have. That's how I look at it. Let me further tell you why this is an easier problem. I have this thesis called the instigator thesis, which is it only takes one entrepreneur, one motivated individual, one motivated scientist to change a whole area. And we only have a dozen areas to change. It's not a hundred different things. And so the opportunity for each of you is to change the world in one of these dimensions I'll talk about. The world had a very different view of EVs in 2010. In fact, one of my favorite slides is a Goldman presentation I saw that forecasted the number of electric cars in 2010 in the year 2035, and Elon Musk by himself exceeded that by 2016. There's a set of expert assumptions that I urge all of you to ignore and just invent the future you want. Same thing happened with plant proteins. Pat Brown, there were no easy agricultural solutions. The problem isn't solved yet, but we know how to solve it now. And once we know how to solve it, it's a matter of time and scaling. It takes time. It takes longer than we think, but we know the solution for animal husbandry, big source of the same is true five years ago when I met Bob Mumgaard. He was a senior fellow at the MIT Plasma Fusion Lab. No business plan really, no really company formed yet. It's turned into conventional wisdom now has it, that fusion is very viable, and there's a dozen robust projects in fusion. Almost certainly, we will have nuclear fusion before the first fission plant can even be permitted. Even the permitting cycles now are longer for fission than fusion makes possible. So what we need is a dozen of you, and dozen minus Pat Brown, dozen minus Elon Musk, dozen minus Bob Mumgaard, so nine of you, to solve these problems. The solutions getting to market I won't go through each of these. Feasible solutions being de-risk. And I can come back and talk about it. Public transit is one of my favorites. I actually believe in 20, 25 years, we will enable 
any city to eliminate more than 50% of the cars in every city at no cost to the city. As if it sounds too incredulous, it's not. It's very feasible. Industrial heat, and then things that we need you to work on. Fertilizers, water, DAC. HVAC is the hardest nut I've seen, uh, I haven't seen easy solutions to. But let me address the question, was clean tech 1.0 a failure? At least for us, it wasn't. In fact, it was successful investment. If you invested in impossible as early as we did, 10 years, more than 10 years ago, at single digit valuations, if you invested in Lanza Tech for sustainable aviation fuel, if you invested in QuantumScape for solid state batteries, it doesn't matter what stock prices are doing. If you did it early and took a lot of risk and a lot of patience, you did just fine. So I challenged the narrative that Clean Tech 1.0 was a failure. It just was failure for people who bailed out early, didn't have patience, didn't stick with it. Portera Verdeji, it started as something, it's now three separate companies all doing extremely well in cement, in hydrogen, and some industrial processing. What are the lessons from 1.0? Think big. If the idea is big, you buy more time. Almost all the incremental solutions died away when financing disappeared. You want patient capital. This is not a hurry up and get an IPO game. It's methodical, first R&D, then pilots, then more. And that involves very staged de-risking and relatively unpredictable schedules. So unless your investors are capable of that, it's very hard to build a company because it's mostly unpredictable. There's a few other things we didn't pay attention to early. Bankability was one. Pivots, lots needed. It's not like the plan you execute is the plan you planned on early. Lots of iteration, lots of adjustment as market environments change but you don't give up on the core vision. Teams really matter. Teams are really tricky, and hopefully I'll have a little more time to talk about it. And finally, the best help and advice. This is a tricky area. What do I, what do I mean? Financing, too much or too little, are both bad. In perovskites, for example, we spent less than five or six million dollars over six or seven years. Very easy to continue supporting when the technology risk was very high and the problems hard. It then becomes an easy thing to finance when the technology is de risk. I found most partnerships don't work. The big partners you're talking about, and this is contrary to the message you get, are too risk averse to help you. They add time and overhead. They do add uh, patina, uh, but they don't help very much. There's very tricky things about financing uh, pilots and what size pilots I won't, don't have time to go into. But these things, it's not obvious what your next pilot size is. It's very, very tricky. We've uh, evolved sort of strategies to address that. What order you address risk in is not the order in which you develop your technology. Again, too much detail to go into here, but really important. And I do want to say boldness creates time. Too many advisors, not enough people authorized or uh, who have earned the right to advise one of you entrepreneurs. 
you'll get advice from everywhere. The hardest thing you will have to do is decide whose advice to take on what topic. Even hiring is not obvious. Hiring people from old industries is very, very dangerous for all startups. People call me and say, I have this person with 30 years of experience. They have 30 years of experience that inventing a new world is a bias. Experience is a bias, which is good if you're trying to repeat the old thing. If you're trying to invent something new, experience is a handicap. Common mistake. So some observations. Startups did not fail um, Cleantech 1.0, investors did. Government funding ha matters, but we didn't get enough of it. We are lucky now. My big point, there's only a dozen really large problems. If we don't solve them, we have a problem in climate. If we do solve them, all the little ones will take care of themselves. And for that, we need this radical, not incremental innovation. 90% of what I see is incremental innovation, engineering more than research. So what are we doing in cli uh, Climate 2.0? A lot of things that I won't go into, but all the important areas. Fusion, fertilizer, industrial heat, mining, steel, I won't go through all of these. Here's the surprising part. I've been doing innovation for 40 years. I can't think of a single example in 40 years where a large innovation came from an institution or institutional advice or expert advice. It almost always comes from dreamers like Elon Musk or Pat Brown or people like that. There's no way anybody from Walmart could have done Amazon, no way anybody from media, NBC or ABC done Twitter, Facebook, media, no way anybody from Boeing or Lockheed would do space. You get my idea. No matter where I look, not a single example in 40 years that has come from an institution, a large player, experts in an area, almost all invented by people who didn't know the area they were entering and went from first principles. We are very lucky. IRA is a supercharger, and we should welcome the net zero age. The Europeans are responding, and I think it's a great thing for the climate. I do want to urge you that not only do we need to solve the climate problem, it's also about US competitiveness. I'm very much a China hawk, so uh, apologies to anybody here. We have a global competitive race that we have to win. Manufacturing is an important part of it. And of course, institutions like RPE really help by enabling high-risk early projects. Sorry, the clicker doesn't work as well as it might. But it is high risk that matters. It's risk takers that matter. And the naysayers, I always say skeptics never did the impossible. So don't listen to the naysayers. You know, five years ago, nobody thought fusion was reasonable. Now everybody does. Why? Because one or two people changed the worldview. In fact, Lord Calvin, the president of the America, uh, British Royal Society, said he heavier-than-air flying machines are impossible just a few years before the Wright brothers. Happens again and again, so please don't listen to experts on what can can't be done. Thank you very much. <laughs>